Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joost Vervoort. I'm a researcher at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. And I'll be talking today about using gaming to develop public capacities for anticipatory governance. And I'll be talking about this in a food systems context. So first of all, I think we're all profoundly aware that we're uh, living in a time of great transformation. Uh, things are changing very rapidly. And to use the uh, words of uh, uh, University of Toronto professor uh, John Robinson, uh, there are no non-transformative futures. Uh, all futures are transformative. It just depends on whether we're actually heading somewhere that, that is good for all involved. Um, so that's really the challenge. And imagination plays an important part in this because, uh, I mean, as Amitav Ghosh says, we have a crisis of the imagination on our hands. Um, it's often very hard for people to imagine any alternative uh, outside of the current sort of like hyper-capitalist thinking about development and growth. And uh, this is really something that needs to be tackled um, at a deep level. And often when people think about the future, they, one of the key problems there as well is that we live in a sort of consensus reality where people say, well, obviously the present is the present. And, uh, you know, sort of powerful actors say, this is the present. Obviously, everybody agrees uh, the past is like this and the future can only be uh, there are some it's maybe some uncertainty associated with the future. But uh, within those bounds of uncertainty, we sort of know what's going to happen. Right. Um, and to sort of pretend that there is consensus about this. In actuality, uh, uh, people live in multiple presents. Uh, they have multiple, they live in multiple worlds, right? Multiple present realities. Uh, there are multiple paths that people are, are connected to. And if we can sort of be aware of this and work with this reality, then uh, that opens up the future massively, right? Because if people are, if we can acknowledge that people are living in different realities with different pasts, then there are also different sets of futures associated with each of these different realities, which can be combined, connected, um, explored in different directions and so on. So why do we want to talk about game design uh, in this context? Well, when we think about the value of exploring multiple worlds, um, games are uniquely powerful because they allow us to uh, really create entire worlds, uh, whether we're talking about digital or um, analog games or some kind of hybrid. Um, and they allow us to step into new roles that are associated with these worlds. So we really can become new people, different people, take uh, uh, future perspectives. Uh, there's work at, the, at RIN that uh, focuses on future generations, which really fits with this very well. Um, new rules, we can explore new forms of governance, new ways of working together and see how we re relate to that. And finally, also new capacities. So, um, what capacities do we need and do we develop when we engage with the world in a different way? So this is a really exciting space to explore, but most of the uh, work uh, so far in the sort of food systems and sustainability space happens very much on what is called applied games or serious games. So these are games that are sort of used much like a serious game uh, or much like a, a scenario or a modeling approach would be used or some other participatory process as a sort of alternative to explore uh, in depth uh, decision making problems or participation problems, which is of course wonderful. But at the same time, there's this massive commercial world of games uh, out there, which is it's arguably the biggest form of media at the moment and has been for some time. And so to connect these two worlds, the worlds of sort of applied serious gaming and societal games is um, are going to be really valuable. And there are many different bridges to be made. So one of them is through thinking about futures literacy. How uh, well are people able to uh, kind of discern and create different futures and work with them to, to make new things uh, come, uh, come to life and become realities? Uh, and that could be, we could be looking at educational context, informal learning context, etc. Another side to the story could be social and political capital. So. Uh, the whole ecosystems uh, and the online culture that uh, exists around uh, games, especially when you think about commercial games, is a really interesting space to explore. And I will show you some examples uh, of games that sort of hit various parts of this. Uh, but first, just say that uh, if we look at the uh, 
uh, sort of diversity of futures that are, are exporting commercial games. This is work by Marion Behrens. Um, the imaginations are quite limited. A lot of, lots of these futures are sort of like mainstream dystopian stories, especially in the bigger games, uh, the AAA, sort of big scale commercial games. It's a lot about a hero in a sort of standard dystopian world. Um, in independent games or indie games, there are it's a little, little bit more diverse and there's a little bit more space for um, other types of futures, but it's still quite limited. And we can look at the roles of developers, incentives for these developers, the audience they engage with, and the influences of other media to help understand uh, why this is the case and how we can break open this space. And one way to break open this uh, sort of ra relatively limited space for game development is through game jams. So we have a lot of experience with this. So game jams are uh, basically brainstorming uh, events where people create games rather rapidly over a week, uh, for instance, and then maybe working on it a little bit later um, uh, as a way to explore various issues in new game formats and to just to come up with new game prototypes. And this is wonderful because, um, uh, you know, if you make many games, each of these games can represent a different future and people can be learning together by making new game worlds. So I just want to show you a few examples. Uh, from a sort of food systems context uh, from recent game jamming work. So we made a bunch of games, our students uh, made a bunch of games with our guidance for the uh, CGIAR climate change, agriculture and food security program. Um, and the games were all focusing on gender relations uh, and gender uh, sort of uh, issues and challenges and um, uh, youth uh, in an agriculture and food security context. And one of the one of the games that was developed, which is a wonderful game, is called Harm to Table. Uh, this is a game where you play a smallholder farmer in the global south, in a global south context, and uh, the other player plays a consumer, and you see how the consumer behavior interacts uh, with the uh, the life of the farmer. So it's very much a sort of food systems, different life worlds kind of game, and it's a multiplayer game where people. Can, uh, they're playing the game locally, so they can talk a lot together, just sort of face-to-face uh, -face about um, uh, what they're doing in the game and how the different choices that they're making are influencing uh, the other person's life. Second game is an analog game uh, with some digital support called Sustainabuild, which is a, um, a game that's currently being developed with people in uh, Kenya, and it's meant for uh, communities, rural communities, who are exploring different adaptation options when it comes to climate change and sort of collection, collective action questions. Um, and then another game which is meant for more for the sort of commercial market is a game uh, about um, climate challenges and adaptation and migration also being developed with uh, people from, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the Horn of Africa. Um, and it's more of a story-driven game and seeing how different capacities impact uh, different story elements in the game. And then finally, another uh, very interesting game sort of prototype was Tnalp, which was a, um, a game that takes a multi-species approach where you can play various parts of a sort of farm environment uh, all these uh, uh, animals and plants, uh, and even at some point, um, things like laws and money, uh, and you can take these perspectives to uh, to understand sort of the life world of a smallholder farmer. Um, and, and, you know, the life world concept is something that the Feast Project has also worked with. So it's connecting systems, life worlds, and practices uh, in these kinds of games, which is really wonderful to see. Beyond these sort of prototypes that explore different game ideas, uh, we've also been working on more fully fledged games. So this is an example called Utrecht 2040, which is a game developed for all uh, students at Utrecht University across the entire university for them to sort of get acquainted with sustainability challenges. And uh, Asset is also involved in the development of this game. And this uh, game is really built to uh, it's a location-based game, so people go out on the streets uh, and they get assignments to reimagine, in this case, the city of Utrecht uh, uh, 
in 2040 and really think about what needs to change. And they do lots of assignments. You can obviously see this is before Corona, right? But it can be played in Corona times as well with smaller teams or individuals, and it's all taking place outside. Uh, but people engage publics and uh, and do all kinds of missions to sort of reimagine the city. And they the the activities that they're doing and the documentation of that is spread out all across the city map while they're walking around with their mobile phones. And uh, they can see each other's work in a sort of social media format. And the, the result is a sort of alternate reality layer of a future Utrecht that's slowly starting to cover the entire city. And this game can be played with thousands of people. So that's really exciting. And uh, Astrid will tell a little bit more about the work that we've done with the FEES team around games, uh, uh, connecting games to other foresight methods, uh, working on the Food Policy Council. Uh, but that's very much part of this sort of stream of thinking as well. And uh, sort of inspired by the um, Utrecht 2040 game and also to some extent by the game that Asset will be talking about, uh, there we are developing a new mobile game uh, based on a project called Seeds of Good Anthropocenes, uh, which is a global research project that focuses on uh, bringing together all kinds of local radical innovations that people are doing all around the world and thinking about how these could be combined into big transformation pathways. Um, we're building a digital game where people combine these local innovations into these pathways uh, uh, as well. And this game we will uh, sort of uh, focus initially on East Africa and then be uh, rolled out. And the, the images you see here are from Southern Africa where a lot of this seeds work has been done. Uh, and, uh, and so just to sort of use that sort of scenario thinking, transformation pathway thinking in a gamified format with lots of people is the goal of this game development. Um, so you see that there are, these games all have sort of aspects of what we're, what we're talking about here with the sort of interaction between applied games and commercial games, but there's still more to explore in the sort of larger cultural space. So I want to talk about that very briefly because games can really be a cultural force and there are things happening that uh, should be taken into account uh, in that regard. So, um, for instance, a, a, a very intimidating example of this is that many game designers are looking at the conspiracy theory movement QAnon as a sort of like alternate reality game, complete with sort of dungeon masters that come up with um, uh, critical information that people are then deciphering and they're then doing sort of like all these things out there to, uh, to work out what all of this means and what the conspiracy uh, is doing. Um, and, you know, some, a bunch of these people were involved in the White House, or, sorry, in the, in the, the Capitol uh, coup uh, this week, which uh, uh, kind of shows how, uh, how deep the alternate reality really goes in this case. Uh, it's very interesting to look at, obviously quite uh, disconcerting as well. Uh, a more benign example, perhaps, uh, depending on your political leanings, is that many young political figures like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are uh, streaming uh, online gaming uh, and they're using it to connect to new audiences and also to some degree to talk about politics while this streaming is happening. And that's, you know, getting a lot of attention um, and really stepping into that sort of game game streaming world that is, uh, has become very popular. Uh, another example, uh, more of a, a sort of like normal game example, you could say, is the fa fantastic um, role-playing game Disco Elysium, an award-winning game which comments very concretely on the challenges of dealing with different political systems and actually features a lot of uh, people who are involved in political activism as uh, people who are, for instance, doing voice acting in these games. So this space of engaging with gamified uh, cultural change and the role of games in cultural change is becoming quite extensive and multidimensional, which is uh, really interesting to look at. So thank you very much. Uh, so all the student games can be found at hio. slash jam slash sustainability jam 2020. Uh, I hope you have a, a, a great conference and, uh, and just send me an email if you want to know more about any of this. Thank you very much.